In this clip, we see bombardiers visually sighting training targets with the Sperry C-1 bombsight. This site and the Norden bombsight were the only two precision bombsites adopted by the USAAF during World War II. The Sperry bombsight is overshadowed by the Norden bombsight based on literature and YouTube searches. Also, the Norden outsold the Sperry by a ratio of 18 to 1. There exists a popular YouTube video on the myth of the Norden bombsite as the biggest lie in World War II. In that video stated twice, to the effect, the Norden bombsite was inferior to the Sperry bombsite. No backup evidence, justification, or rationale for this statement is provided, and we shall see it is a totally false claim. The intent of this video is to compare the Norden versus Sperry's bombsite's performance, accuracy advantages, disadvantages, and rationalize why the Sperry's were ordered discontinued in September 1943. At the end of the presentation, I'll show a training clip of the bombsite in use during a practice run. The USAAF's precision bombing campaign required two instruments that work together to accurately release bombs, as described on this page from a declassified 1944 Army Air Force's Historical Studies document on World War II bombsite maintenance training. These items are the bombsite and the bomber's autopilot. During the bomb run, the plane must fly straight, level, and maintain a constant speed and be stable for around 30 seconds. During the 30 second or so bomb run, these flight parameters are met by the bomber's autopilot system. The bomb site is linked to the autopilot. The bombardier just focuses his effort on tracking the target through the bomb site's crosshairs, and the autopilot will place the plane in the correct position at bomb release. The autopilot flies the plane as the bomb site directs it. This image shows the Norden M series bombsite and the Honeywell S1 autopilot and the Sperry S1 bombsite and its Sperry A5 autopilot. This chart outlines a no wind, two dimensional bomb trajectory and associated definitions from bomb release. The target is here. A B 17's bombsite and autopilot will position the plane here for bomb release, depending on many factors like speed, altitude, and bomb ballistics. Assume a B-17 bomber releases their M-64 bombs here at a formation altitude of 25,000 feet at a true air speed of 230 miles per hour. We can use this chart to define the distance from bomb release to target from a 1944 Terminal Ballistics Data document. For bomb release at a 25,000 foot altitude at a true airspeed of 230 miles per hour, the actual range is around 13,000 feet or 2.5 miles. The bomb site will need to trigger the bombs to be released 2.5 miles back from the target. In real life, the bombardier will need to compensate for wind by changing the plane's heading, like seen in this three dimensional bomb release image. This image shows the bombardier's eye ring impression from the bomb site's eye cup guard. For reference, let's follow a single bomb drop from a 17,000 foot altitude to the target. You want to focus on this part of the target. These are dummy bombs tested post-World War II over Germany. The target was sighted visually by the B-29's Norden bombsite using the Honeywell A-5 autopilot. These tests are to check the integrity of the steel case as the bomb penetrates through the thick concrete roof. You should just make out the bomb's supersonic boundary layer as it makes contact with the thick concrete roof. The bombs were not filled with explosives. This page from a July 1943 Wright Field Air Command document outlines combat requirements of the bomber's integrated bombsite and autopilot. The system must be simple to operate and accurate. Bombardiers need to follow these five rules. The planes will need to change heading and altitude to avoid flak fire. Bomb strike accuracy is paramount. The length of the bomb run should be no longer than the flat gun's projectile time of flight. This is roughly 20 to 30 seconds depending on bombing altitude. Planes in the formation should be arranged to give good fields of defensive supporting fire. In September 1943, the Army Air Forces convened a board to evaluate and compare the performance of both the Norden and Sperry bomb sites and their associated autopilot systems as discussed in this report. These are the members of the board and these are the expert witnesses called to testify. This Exhibit J describes the performance conclusions of the evaluation. For long bomb runs without using the autopilot, some data shows the Norden provides superior accuracy over the Sperry. For long bomb runs with the autopilot, some data shows the Norden having superior accuracy. The Sperry A5 autopilot showed some functional difficulties. For a short bomb run, insufficient data to make an accuracy comparison. Even with Sperry system improvements planned, the Norden will be more accurate.
This page from a 1944 Army Air Force's Historical Studies report on bombardier training in World War II discusses deficiencies of the Sperry bomb site. The Sperry bomb site is inferior to the Norden bomb site based on combat conditions when on a short bomb run. A Sperry equipped bomber will need to maintain heading variations within 5 degrees. If bombing without autopilot assistance or manual, the bombardier tells the pilot how to fly. A Sperry unit bomb run requires from one and a half to two and a half minutes to set up the system. This page outlines additional Sperry bombsite issues from a July 1943 Air Material Command Wright Field Sperry bombsite and A-5 autopilot evaluation document. At this time, the Norton bombsite and C-1 autopilot fulfills USAAF bombing requirements. The Sperry S-1 site and A-5 autopilot fall short in meeting these requirements based on these deficiencies. No tangent scale gauge on the bomb unit. The drift and drop angles cannot be preset accurately. The dropping angle and sighting angles must be quickly and easily compared by the bombardier. The length of the bomb run cannot be quickly found. The A5 autopilot reacts too fast. Maintaining group or squadron formation cohesion for pattern bombing is not possible. This is a big deal as almost all combat bombing is done by the group lead bombardier. Group or squadron reaction rates and magnitude of bank and turn angles should be slow enough for the wingmen to maintain their formation positions. Sperry equipped planes would need to attack targets singly. The bomb site and autopilots would need to be modified to correct these deficiencies. The Norden's optics are far superior to the Sperry's. The Norden provides better target sighting and visibility. Light transmission is less in the Sperry site. Complete redesign of the Sperry bomb site would be needed to correct this deficiency. Sperry optics tend to collect oil, grease, and dust. 50% of incoming light is rejected. This reduces optic head visibility. In addition, bombardiers experience difficulty in locating unfamiliar targets with the Sperry site. This is made worse if approaching the target within 30 degrees of the sun's position or if approaching at high altitude or the target is cloaked by haze. The front optics are not accessible and accumulated fog cannot be cleared away. Operationally, the Norden bombsite is far superior to the Sperry bombsite. Modifications to the Sperry bombsite and autopilot system to make them acceptable would take six months of a redesign effort to operational status. Variations in the plane's electrical system throw off the Sperry's bombsite accuracy. The Norden system is superior. The Sperry system reaction to bomber voltage variations is a major issue. The site will either fail to operate or give erroneous bomb release information. The bombardier has no way of knowing if the site readings are correct. The Norden bomb site experiences fewer malfunctions and require less maintenance than the Sperry system. Having two bomb and autopilot systems to equip bombers, train personnel, and maintain is wasteful, even if the systems performed at parity. Based on these evaluations, it is recommended. Production facilities maintain the flow of the M-Series Norden bombsites and Honeywell C-1 autopilots. Standardize the Norden bombsite and C-1 autopilot systems as the bombing systems for the USAAF. Eliminate Sperry bombsite training and production. Maintain and improve the existing Sperry bomb system until planes change over to the Norden system. Combat tactics have not been formalized with the Sperry system. Its deficiencies have soured the minds of those who've used the system. USAAF brass are reluctant to send bombers into combat with the Sperry bomb site. They also believe the Sperry bombing system is inferior to the Norden bomb site. All heavy and 25% of medium bombers should be equipped with the Norden bomb site. This can be accomplished by January 1944. This February 1944 memo indicates that training aircraft should swap out their Sperry bombsite with a Norden bombsite as soon as possible. By May 1944, all B-24s rolling off the production line are to be equipped with the Norden bombsite only. In addition to lack of material, personnel, and training and other issues, users lack confidence in the Sperry bombsite's performance. This lack of confidence applies to both the Sperry C-1 bombsite and the A-5 autopilot. The lack of confidence is from the USAAF. Training Command, 2nd Air Force, and the Army Air Force's headquarters. For a whole host of reasons, the Sperry C-1 bombsite coupled with its A-5 autopilot were eliminated from service and replaced with the much superior Norden bombsite and Honeywell autopilot. This clip shows the Sperry bombsite bombing sequence. That site doesn't work very well without electricity, so you'd better switch on your follow-up amplifier. That's right, take a temperature reading. 
Well, they don't just sit there watching that altimeter. You've got other things you can be doing while you're climbing, like setting in your time of fall. And your trail. That's fine. You remember to see those switches were all down. Now what? Turn your vertical gyro switch on. You've only got another thousand feet to go. You can figure out what the last reading will be from what you have already. Bombardier to pilot, CIA 8850. Open Bombay doors. On course. What's the matter? Why don't you click him back? about uncaging your vertical gyro. Now what's the matter? Oh, you can't find the target? Well, that's happened before. Of course, here on the practice range, it's a little tough. Not like over Germany, where they have all those arrows pointing out the target for you. All right, let's go. Sweep knob for range. And for direction, the azimuth displacement knob with the search switch out. Got it? Now, clutch in your azimuth gyro and turn on your constant speed motor switch. That's the pilot telling you he zeroed his PDI. And here you go. Got much drift? You must have the way you're cranking that rate knob out. You're good, mister, if you can get on the target that way. What are you using, the touch system? Uh-uh, looks like this isn't going to be your big moment after all. Dry run, okay to turn. It certainly looks bad, mister. But then nothing can be as bad as you think it is right now. Go up and I'll show you what you've been doing to the PDI. Let him stand behind you and see what happens when I turn the rate knob. Okay, Dunham, I'll make an azimuth rate turn. Dunham, now suppose I'm drifting, fast. Here's what you did. Jerked it all the way out. You're not just telling the pilot which way to turn. You're telling him how fast to turn. Now suppose I try to stop the turn by yanking the knob back again. How's the pilot going to follow that one? Now I'm going to try and kill my drift again. I'll have to crank out until I stop the motion. But this time, the pilot will have some kind of a chance. I'm still cranking it out. But this time the pilot knows what I'm doing so he can keep up with me. Now I've got the target standing still. I'm ready to go back to detent, but this time the pilot can follow me. Watch now and see how easy it is for him to stay with me. This time he only has to come out of his turn, not make another in the opposite direction. 
I'm moving back to detent. Just fast enough to keep that target still. Okay, come on back and try one. How are you doing now, mister? This is your last bomb, is it? Well, okay. Let's try to get one with an error under 200. Well, looks like you've calmed down the way you're handling that rate knob. Nice and smooth. You're drifting off to the right, so turn the knob slowly back out of detent. Drift is slowing down, so ease that rate knob back to detent. Now get back on the target. Still a little drift. Easy now. It's easy to overcorrect. That's right. At the same time, adjust for rate. Drift seems killed. Now get back on the target. Overcorrecting. Drifting left. Double grip those right knobs and hold it on the target. It's too slow. Looks pretty good. Better match the cross trail pointers. Time's getting short. Big corrections will only get you in trouble now. Double grip right knobs and hold on the target. Arming switch. Bombs away. Well, that's better. Only maybe the pilot would like to know what goes on. Bombardier to pilot. Okay to turn, sir.